<coughs> the opportunities and challenges for the industry are, are the same today as they were uh, a number of years ago, but some have changed. So could you comment and tell us what you see as the key challenges and opportunities for the pharma uh, industry, the different segments of the pharma industry uh, today? Yeah, so I did mention the tailwinds and the headwinds that we have, but if you really look at our industry, I think we still need to do a better job on two fronts when it comes to communicating with outside audiences. First, I think we need better communication with society in general about uh, the innovation that we produce and the need for a proper reward for our innovation. Uh, we, as an industry, have been trying, but we need to do a much better job because you, if you, people don't reward innovation, you're not going to get innovation. So we, we need to tell the story a lot better that is being told. Many people tell the story for us and they don't do a good job. We, we ourselves as an industry have to do that job a lot better. The second is this whole issue of communicating with regulators on the evolving benefit, risk, assessment, and also in the context of personalized medicine. <coughs> for example, many products were taken off the market because there was a sense that the overall benefit to risk assessment was not favorable. Well, what is, how, how, how does one go about making that judgment? Could we have a little better conversation around that subject? And could we use the concept of personalized medicine to uh, let certain products still be available to those patients who need them? I keep hearing from so many patients that they loved Vioxx when it was on the market, and they would be willing to take the risk if uh, that product was available. Uh, so if individual products work for individual patients, why not make those products available? So we as an industry really have to work very hard at this. Uh, I think it's an opportunity, but a lot, a lot more needs to be done there. Now a related question, you know, I, I, I was asking you about what the key opportunities and challenges are today, but uh, looking forward, and in particular since I think it is accepted by people in the industry that the traditional business model, certainly for big pharma, has, has been in trouble, right? So what suggestions would you have for the pharma, specialty pharma companies with regard to forward-looking sort of strategies and execution, things that they should focus on beyond what you had mentioned about regulatory and so forth? Yeah, I, I still think that uh, those portfolio decisions that I mentioned and then the project decisions are extremely important. And I think the decisions should not only be taken, be taken by the R&D head uh, in, their own, uh, uh, in their own division. They should be discussed in a very open manner with the CEO and the commercial people because these are important decisions. Those companies that, that decide wisely on portfolio and also on the allocation of R&D assets uh, will do a lot better than those that kind of don't do it in the right manner. For example, if one has a great uh, breakthrough in oncology, uh, why not spend a lot of money on 10 different indications in phase one to see where it might work, and then go after those as opposed to going the classical route phase one, phase two, phase three. That kind of dialogue becomes much more possible if the head of R&D has the benefit of some other people also pressure testing that decision making process. Those decisions can make a huge difference. Business development decisions, where something comes along, it's uh, expensive, uh, people think it's very expensive, nobody wants to have the courage to come forward and say, look, I really want this to be the case. So, a good discussion might in the end still be, a, it still may be worthwhile buying that extraordinary technology that will totally transform the company. Uh, those are the kinds of things that can make a big difference, in my opinion. Yeah, speaking further on that, I think one of the hallmarks, I think, of your success uh, at Pharmacia and Insuring Cloud was really how you managed r &D. Yeah. because I and, and of course, it also happens to be one of the most critical areas for uh, for pharma companies, uh, and especially pharma companies. So could you talk a little bit more about how you created this balance somehow? Because 
as you know, in a lot of the companies, one of the biggest challenges is, in fact, how, man how you manage R&D and how you point them in the right direction. Yeah. So I, I showed you the slide earlier on that uh, you're supposed to reinvent yourself. 70% of the portfolio every 10 years is down to 46%, which is really one reason why we've lost about over 300,000 jobs in our industry in the last 10 years. Uh, so this is serious. This is very, very serious. That's why CEOs need to take it seriously and be involved with it. They may not have a life sciences background. A lot of us don't have that. But there is no reason why, they, why CEOs should not be in this thing. And the, the question should be more around uh, why are we spending the money on these things and, and, how, and what will success look like? And, and when will we see some results? And if we don't see the results, what would we do at that time? Are we going to make sure that that project will get killed? Uh, having early kills is very important. I know we give a lot of lip service to this, but really making that happen is an important way to improve the, uh, the productivity of R&D. And having the commercial person be a partner, a business partner in the process <coughs> is important. And, and, and really, wherever possible, if the head of R&D is not a medical person, it's fine. Uh, the head of R&D might be a PhD, but make sure that there's a separate medical voice as part of the conversation so that some of the decisions are made in a very uh, balanced manner. Uh, sometimes if you're purely a person out of the labs, uh, you may not have the perspective of a clinician, and, and having that is, is extremely important. So if you don't have, if your head of R&D does not have the medical background, then have a separate chief medical officer who reports to uh, you directly as CEO, and make sure the chief medical officer is part of the conversation. Now, my next question is somewhat different, but it's also, uh, shall we say, a somewhat controversial topic. And uh, as you look amongst uh, the large pharma companies around the world, and, and, and many of them are in a variety of different businesses, some are still in a variety of businesses, buyers in pharma, and, uh, and also in, 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 uh, in chemicals and so forth. Uh, and a number of companies have uh, more recently been uh, selling off or spinning off their non-pharma businesses. So I'd really like your opinion about whether is, is, is that the right thing to do? Uh, would they, is, is this uh, making analysts happy, but in fact not creating uh, sort of related diversification and so forth? You know, what's your perspective on this? Because this is an area that a lot of people have different opinions. Yeah, I think we all look at portfolios and we all accept the fact that diverse portfolios always have an advantage over uh, very concentrated portfolios. If you're down to one product, you have a huge risk at that stage. So the wider the portfolio, the better. Um, if, uh, if it's pure, pure pharma, but you have a wide portfolio, then, then, then maybe you, you, you don't need to diversify that much. But there are many companies that have attached consumer divisions or animal health divisions or even device divisions. Um, as long as they understand the ability, if, as long as they have a mindset of making these different divisions work together to create a better sum of the parts, as long as they have the mindset to make that happen, I think it often makes sense to have these divisions as part of the same company. What often happens in our industry, though, is that the head of uh, the company is a person from a pure pharma RX background, and they treat the other divisions as secondary divisions and don't also populate them with the best in, best people for their particular business models. And in that process, they actually lose an opportunity to grow the value of those businesses. Where that is the case, I would say it's better to let those things go in the hands of those who can make more value out of them than try to keep them just as a financial diversification. There has to be an operational logic to having them part of the company, uh, pure financial diversification, there's much less of a reason to keep them. Yeah, actually, I think you have a good point. Um, you know, I started my career uh, uh, with Bain Company when they first got started, and most of your clients were pharma and, and chemicals and, and animal health. And one of my clients was Monsanto, and they were in pharma, 
and they were in ag chem and they were in chemicals, and believe me, uh, the, the role of chemicals was just to provide cash for the pharma business, right? So it was very devastating for that part uh, you know, of, of the company. Um, I'd like to turn more from industry topic, more to a personal one. And um, I think we've all really admired your career in, as a CEO of a number of companies. I guess maybe the word is serial CEO, I guess, is, is, the, is the right one, and, and a lot of successes. But as they say, when, you, when, when, uh, when you're a CEO and, and going 100 miles an hour, uh, the real question is, what happens when you transition, right? So really my question is, how have you found the tradition, that transition from CEO to being more uh, uh, private equity and uh, chairman of companies? Because it's a, it's a different role, right? Well, you know, as CEOs, we tend to uh, focus on our people so that they can focus on the business and take pride in the success of our people. So as CEOs, many of us are really well prepared to make the transition to a different story where we are not directly in a command and control situation. Uh, I made the transition very easily. Uh, I, uh, I just... Uh, realized that I was at a stage in my life where I wanted to remain intellectually engaged, I wanted to make my contributions, and I didn't need to run a company. Um, so in the word of private equity, we have two uh, words uh, that describe different people. You're either a financial, you're either a deal guy or you're an operator. So I was called an operator and not a deal guy, but that's okay. In fact, I've learned a lot of the financial lingo and I understand it very well now. Uh, but if I'm the operator, so be it. I, I have a perspective. And as I look at different uh, companies in the portfolio, I do actually help the CEOs in these portfolio companies quite a bit. I mentor them. And then also in terms of assessing businesses, it's not very different from a business development and licensing deal that one would do in an operating company. So in many ways, I'm engaged in the same manner, but it's probably a lot better being where I am right now than being in a command and control situation running a company. I'll tell, I'll tell one of Fred's secrets he says, I'm not planning on playing a lot of golf. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, my, 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 best score, my, my best score was in the 70s when I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and it's only gone down since then. <laughs> well, Fred, I'll tell you, my best score was in the 70s, but that was for the first nine holes. <laughs> So what I'd like to do now is really open up to questions from the audience, and what I'd like to do is anyone who asks a question, just uh, identify who you are and address the question to uh, Fred. Fred, Doug Long, Doug Long from IMS. Uh, good to see you. I was here four years ago. Before you just retired from Turing Bob and you had a great uh, run at Boston Long. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you talked about Medicare Part D, you know, in 2006 and the cooperation that went on between pharma and uh, the White House at that time. And uh, fast forward to the implementation of uh, Obamacare. And, um, you know, which it seems to be a recurring nightmare. You know, and, and uh, I guess that when they're claiming that only, they only reject, or only, they only have 10% of the stuff as heirs, they call that good news because it used to be 25%. What was the difference between this last, uh, you know, Obamacare, the collaboration uh, versus uh, Medicare Part D? Yeah, I was quite involved with the Part D, uh, and uh, the industry got together because there was a sense that uh, Medicare, when it had first come on, on, on the scene in 65, uh, was really focused on hospitals because drugs did not play a big role in those days. Then by the time we were discussing this, drugs had become a very important part of uh, medicine. And uh, seniors were, there were stories in the press about seniors going on buses across the border trying to get cheaper drugs. And the industry said, we want to be proactive on this. We want to do the right thing in improving uh, coverage. And uh, they went to their usual supporters uh, on both sides of the aisle, more on the Republican side, and convince them that this is a good idea. This thing is a good idea because we're improving coverage for seniors, and we're actually getting, we're just removing a problem that exists for, for older people. It's not fair. And uh, it was more that than the stories that one reads in the press about the industry wanting to sell a bigger volume of their own medicine, because in fact, the rebates did increase 
and the overall benefits might have gone up for a short time, but overall I'm not that sure that the profit impact was that large. It was more the fact that a societal issue had to be dealt with. The fact that it was a bipartisan approach was, uh, was very helpful. I write in the book about the uh, help that uh, was given by Senator Baucus, who uh, went against some of the people uh, on his side to support the legislation. Uh, the bipartisan aspect was good. And then also uh, the HHS secretary and the CMS, uh, they both, the head of CMS, uh, Martin McClellan, he, both of them, I don't remember the name of the uh, head of HHS at that time. Levitt. Levitt. So it was a team, uh, uh, both of them along with the industry. They came to see the industry, they asked for industry's help, support, advice, and this kind of a joint effort uh, helped overcome the initial problem that any program of this type faces. There were articles coming, especially in the New York Times, about how this program was not going to work, how the seniors were not going to sign up, but really the fact that right at the front end so much intense energy was unleashed and <coughs> the fact that the program came through at a lower cost per member per month than what, this, what the CBO had, had, had foreseen and also the fact that the formularies were up to 4,000 in width uh, which actually <coughs> made access of, uh, available a lot better. The story started to change and the whole thing went in the right direction. Here, unfortunately, the sequence of stories have gone in the wrong direction. And I would still think we should go ahead with this now that we are here. But uh, it's really a pity that uh, the implementation has not been the same way as the Part D. There's a big difference. And uh, I'd even said that publicly, that uh, the implementation of this thing is a bigger challenge than the legislation itself. And unfortunately, that has happened. Uh, Howard Flood, I'm Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Stokes Sabi Foundation. Thank you very much for a really inspiring and cogent coherent <coughs> talk. Um, so I have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, just to follow up on one thing, um, with 90% of the drugs now being generic, yeah. and uh, the payers, you know, we have drugs in most classes now, um, it's hard to get our formulary. So it seems to me, that, and we've seen this with a our foundation helped to bring the first diagnostic test for Alzheimer's disease to market, but it's not being paid for. So this was a, a company started with $7 million in 2005, sold to Lilly for $800 million in 2010. BGE and Marvel, 35 years ago, if you said to me that we would have a test, a brain scan that could diagnose Alzheimer's disease without a brain biopsy or an autopsy, I would probably say that would never happen. Now we have that test, and instead of hundreds of thousands of people having access, there's probably been 800 tests in the whole country, and it's all private pay. <coughs> um, Alzheimer's, you mentioned as a big need. It's very possible, although we have a 99.6% failure rate with drugs in Alzheimer's disease, that in the next three or five years, we might have a drug that's disease modifying. But if we can't demonstrate the cost effectiveness and the value of that drug, we might even get an FDA approval even if the drug has risks, but it won't get paid unless we have patient advocacy, which says that we spent $1.3 billion in 12 to 15 years to develop a drug, and access to that drug ultimately may be dependent on patient advocacy. So I, I just wonder, and in the context of Obamacare and accountable care, care organizations and capitation and more restrictive formularies, how are we going to promote innovation? How, how, how is a pharmaceutical executive decision to stay in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think uh, I don't know the, the, uh, the cost benefit of this particular situation, but I think one has to argue uh, these uh, these things. And maybe this test is not as valuable now as it might be when there's a drug that might really work a lot better. But I'm really glad that this innovation does exist. Uh, I think uh, there will be always uh, cases which uh, have to be reimbursed outside the regular caps that exist. Uh, there's a lot of that already in place in Germany, and I think there's going to be a lot of that here too. Special exemptions, uh, I think those are going to have to be argued. I think also there has to be some pricing constraint and pricing discipline, because if, if innovations are hugely expensive, 
then then it's very hard for peers to step forward and and to do that. I think there has to be some 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 discipline there as well. Uh, I've always argued that the best way to solve the issue of very high priced innovations is to reduce the cost of innovation. I still think the hurdles are so high and the requirements to get products approved are so high that it forces innovators to finally, when they come on the market, to, to price them at, at, at levels which are seen as being very high by the peers. So I think the dialogue has to keep on going. Uh, but fortunately, on the positive side, uh, the cost of drugs as a percent of the total healthcare costs has remained more or less the same, and it might have even moved in a slightly lower direction because of the high number of large products that have gone generic in recent years. But, but you're right, there are individual cases like that where there will be a controversy around uh, who, who's going to pay for these expensive new products. Yeah, and uh, just one comment I make is that, unfortunately, in, in the dimension you're talking about, you've got two things that are happening. One is uh, the rest of the world is allowing you know, pharmaceuticals to be tested in the U.S. with the FDA and so forth. But they're not willing, or many countries are not willing to pay a price that would help pay back the, the, the R&D. And, you know, but they don't understand how that can be a contradiction. The other is, I, unfortunately, I think popular opinion, where it used to be extremely positive towards the pharmaceutical industry, has gone the other way, but unfairly. Because the reality is, any study you look to see what effect uh, pharmaceuticals had on the cost of healthcare, particularly getting you uh, either better or avoiding being in the hospital. It's a dramatic uh, effect on, on cost of health care in a positive way. Yeah. But it's not perceived that way because people go and they have to pay for the drugs and they don't, they don't, they don't realize that. But uh, I think probably the pharmaceuticals have done more to reduce health care costs than anything I can think of. Yeah, if you especially look at the quality of life and the improvement of, uh, and the length of life in that context, the, uh, the reward to society has been huge, huge in the last 60 years. Have a question? Yes, uh, Jim Manuso, Chairman Emeritus of Aztecs, uh, which I recently sold to Otsuka. And in, in connection with uh, the convergence, really, of business development and M&A, something Peter and I were discussing earlier, uh, we're seeing much more in the way of contingent valuation rights and maybe bleeding over into uh, uh, royalties and uh, this kind of thing. What do you envision by way of uh, better risk sharing models in future uh, in the M&A arena? Yeah, I think this uh, contingent value right concept of those kinds of vehicles is really a very important way to make things happen because nobody wants to take a big risk up front when you may not know what the outcome might be down the road. Um, I, I, I think you'll see more and more of these kinds of models in the future. Uh, in the private equity space where I'm at, we, we often sell our assets in that manner with uh, payouts down the road, milestones down the road. I think that, that's a, that, that concept should only grow uh, in order to create a liquidity in the market. Otherwise, the market is not going to be very liquid. It's a good point. Well, with that, well, okay, one more question. Paul Barone with Inspirion Pharmaceuticals. And thanks for the presentation. Uh, just want to comment, you know, Merck's in need of a turnaround. I don't know if you know that, I'm sure, but, you know, they, they could have, could be used a while back. But uh, my question is, you know, you mentioned how right now the, the IRR is not really commensurate with the cost of capital. And so, you know, the pharma companies are dividing out more money than, you know, investing. And it seems like they have to, you know, improve the probability of success of the phase three compounds, as you mentioned, which has gone down. And then also improve, you know, reimbursement and pricing, uh, especially in large markets like Alzheimer's and diabetes. And it's caused everybody to look to oncology and rare diseases because they do have pricing flexibility there, and <coughs> faster regulatory pathways to approval, I think. So I was just wondering how, how you could see, uh, you know, the pharma industry influencing those two things to try and get a, a better playing field. Really. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think, uh, <clears throat> I hope, I haven't seen the data, but I hope that because of the new tools and the new restructuring and the new reinvention that the industry has gone through, 
the success rates in phase three will start to move up. Maybe not back to the numbers that were there in the mid 80s, but hopefully to a much better level than 50%. It's just not acceptable. Uh, I have grown up in an industry where the most important decision point was that point when you decided to go into a phase three thing, because you're now talking 700, 800 million dollars in many cases. And generally, you need to have a pretty good sense of success when you make that decision. If it's only 50 percent, it's very discouraging. So that, that, that thing has to improve. And the only way I can see that improving is, number one, don't let people kill a project because the commercial people lost interest. That should never be acceptable in any company. Surprisingly, to this day, that nonsense still goes on in companies. Because everybody should be at the table when that decision is made, and people should not be allowed to change their minds down the road. But number two, use better science and technology. Use better work at phase two, phase one, to prove what you're trying to do. Get the biomarkers in place. Get the thesis in place, so that the chances of success goes up. We've been talking about it for a while, but hopefully now we'll be able to start to do it. As far as reimbursements are concerned, I think we have to do a little better job in showing the value of the medicine that's coming along. We have to find ways to show some comparators if possible. And also, we need to be a little more restrained with our pricing expectations. I think uh, sometimes in our desire to get the money back quickly, we might be pricing the product more than we need to. And that does create a big pushback from the payers. Thanks. Well, Fred, thank you so much. Uh, I, your, both your speech and I think your, your, your uh, fireside chat and your answer to these questions were really exceptional. And obviously, the fact that more people want to ask questions is, a, is an indication of that. So thank you so much. And uh, I encourage everyone uh, to read Fred's book. And you have your copy. And uh, we are, look forward to the next chapter uh, in your career, which I'm sure will be very exciting. Thank you.